and I'm a proud rural Oregonian who believes in protecting our democracy. And that includes electing good leaders we can trust to serve all Oregonians. Uh, over the past few months, emerging rural leaders have reached out for help getting the word out on how they want to serve their communities. And so I've uh, joined with friends to help amplify the voices of some great rural candidates. Um, and we'll be doing this Tuesdays and Thursdays through the election. Um, and uh, also want to just encourage you to vote. I'm going to say a little bit more about that later. But for now, I'd like to introduce the really great candidates we have with us today. Uh, Beth Spell, Kim Schmidt, Ashley Carson Cottingham. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, Jamie. And um, so let's let's jump right into it. Um, I'm going to ask you all to just start by introducing yourselves. Tell us a little bit about the district and that you're you're running in, or the counties you're running in, and some of your priorities. Beth, why don't we start with you? Hey, my name is Beth Spell, and I'm running for House of Representatives for House District 60. Um, it is the largest district in the state of Oregon when you talk about um, acreage or miles. It encompasses Baker County, Grant County, Harney County, Malheur County, and this small portion of Lake County, the southeast corner of Lake County. We um, have uh, primarily ranchers, farmers, some small industries in the larger communities. An interesting component is 18% of our um, district is composed of Hispanic people and Spanish speaking people. And actually the bulk of those people live in Harney County. So we are becoming a more diverse area than we have been in the past. And so we have a need to uh, develop different strategies for families being successful and um, living in, in our wonderful, beautiful country. Uh, we need to start looking at ways that we can make it so families are successful and have a good opportunity to stay or come back mm -hmm. to where they were born and um, live very fruitful and um, happy lives. Uh, those of us who grew up in this area or choose, chose to move here know that it's a wonderful place for families, but families need to be able to be um, gainfully employed. They need to have affordable housing. They need to have affordable health care. They need to have affordable child care. They need um, access, equal access to all the responsibilities or all the facilities that make education possible for their kids. Well, thanks so much, Beth. And uh, the high desert of uh, Eastern Oregon is such a beautiful area. But yes, um, it's um, very uh, sparsely populated in some places. But also, a lot of Oregonians don't realize that Oregon covers two time zones, of Malheur counties in the next time zone over. So it's always a trick when you're driving through to switch over your, your clock when you're, uh, when you're doing that. Um, Kim, let's go to you next, and uh, a neighbor of mine here in Jefferson County. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, some of your priorities. My name is Kim Smith, and I'm running for county commissioner in Jefferson County. <clears throat> it's actually a nonpartisan position, so it, it changes the flavor a little bit. I think that's different than what most people are, are running for currently. Um, I love my county. I grew up here. Um, I went to school here. I then went to school at Oregon State University, traveled abroad after living abroad for several years, came back, um, got some more education. And then I opened in 1999, a small healthcare clinic in um, Madras. And uh, I love it. I still love it here. And part of the reason why I ran is we are missing a little vitality right now. We've kind of gotten a little bit of rut. It's, it definitely is, we have three Republicans on the county commission. And while it's supposed to be nonpartisan, they've made it very, very partisan. And I disagree with that. So that's part of the flavor that I'm bringing. In fact, anything, I don't talk a lot about being a Democrat. Um, I, I more show what it means to be a Democrat, what, my, what I stand for and how I wanna move forward. So um, it sounds a little bit different, but one of my big deals is broadband. We need countywide broadband. People don't know that there are parts of my county that use dial up. Oh my Lord, I cannot imagine. Even on my phone, dial up would drive me insane. So, how do they go to school with dial up? They don't. 
They can't go to community college. They can't do online school right now. Um, if they're if they're attempting uh, to do higher ed, it, it you can't. And so we flat out need that. We have such a great place to live. We could have people working here for the quality of life and, and telecommuting to Bend or Portland or New York City, but and they could live here. So I really want to work on that countywide high speed, I should put in there, high speed internet. But otherwise, also just like Beth, we really have to focus on our education here and affordable and available housing is, is near and dear to my heart. So those are some of the areas that I'm working on. Well, thank you. And uh, talking about education here in Jefferson County is especially near and dear to my heart. I serve on the, the Education Service District Board and you're right, um, now with this time of distance learning, it's so difficult in places yeah. that don't have uh, access to, to broadband. Some have access to dial-up. Some areas don't have access to either, as you mentioned. And it's just, it's so critically important for not just the economic development, but also preparing our next generation, making sure our kids have access to, to school um, to school and education. And Ashley, you um, have uh, one of the, um, in your, the counties you're running for, Marion County, includes both uh, very urban and very rural areas. And um, and I know especially those rural areas are, are near and dear to your heart. Sorry, I've got my dog joining me in the background there. Um, <laughs> tell us a bit about yourself, about your county, and some of your priorities. Great, well, thank you for hosting today. This is a great opportunity. Um, yes, I'm Ashley Carson Cottingham. I'm running for Marion County Commissioner, um, seat three. Uh, Marion <laughs> County is a very large county. Um, we have you know, Salem, Kaiser, more urban areas, and then we have a lot of rural communities across our county, um, you know, going all the way out Highway 22, up the canyon down towards Jefferson, up north of Woodburn. So, you know, it stretches a long way and we have a lot of different dynamics going on in our county. Um, I am a fifth generation Oregonian. Um, I was actually born and raised in central Oregon. Um, and I've lived in Eugene for college. I lived up in Portland um, where I worked. Um, and I've been in the Salem area for about six and a half years now. Mm. Um, but advocacy and public service has been in my heart since I was a small child. Um, when I was around seven or eight years old, I would deliver meals on wheels with my grandparents in um, Bend. Um, and I just will never forget the looks on the faces of the people that opened the door to receive what was probably their only meal of that day. And so that had a very deep impact on me. Um, I decided I was going to devote my life to public service. Um, I have a soft spot for seniors. Um, and so I actually went to law school to work on elder justice issues. And I moved to Washington, D.C. after that. Um, I advocated in our nation's capital for the Elder Justice Act, which was included in the Affordable Care Act, for increases to Meals on Wheels, um, for expansion and protection of Social Security and Medicare, um, expansion of Medicaid, all those types of things that we all love um, and care, I mean, want people to have so badly in all parts of our state. Um, I attended U of O. Um, I went to Vermont Law School. Um, I'm a mom of two little boys who we are attempting to do homeschooling right now. Um, for one of them, one is a little too young. Um, and it's hard, but I can't even imagine how hard it is for the folks that have been impacted up our CNEM Canyon from wildfires and who don't have broadband like Kim mentioned. Um, I also have run large government programs in Oregon. So I was the director for aging and people with disabilities for the state, which has 1400 employees and a, a biennial budget of $3.4 billion. So I am ready to hit the ground running. I know what it takes to be transparent, inclusive, to listen to all points of view and to make sure that people are getting the services and supports they need. I believe that's the role of county government is to engage and to spend those dollars wisely to help the people that need it the most. And so that's why I'm running for county commissioner. We've not had a Democrat on our county commission in over 40 years. So it's time for some balance. Um, it's time for more transparency and I'm ready to get to work. Well, thank you so much. An impressive background and resume. And to your point, understanding how different levels of government work together and can be uh, utilized and leveraged to serve the needs of communities. I especially appreciate that not only 
uh, does your, um, your your focus on rural areas? Because not, not only does Marion County, as you mentioned, include um, our state capital, but also the, the challenges that, that we're seeing from rural, urban to rural. Sometimes there's a, a similar challenge, housing, for example, but the solutions are, are a bit different. And so that uh, the background you bring, that understanding is really key to, to crafting and creating solutions that will work for everyone. So really appreciate that. Um, let me ask you all uh, this, this, uh, a couple questions. And this first one has to do with this aspect of serving rural communities. I mean, some of the dynamics we're seeing this urban rural divide in the state, um, it's, sometimes, it's often we're seeing the representation drawn along uh, political lines. But having that sense that, that you all have talked about, that sense of, of service to community and, and identifying challenges of community is something that is, is missing in, from some of these legislative bodies. And with great friends and allies in more urban areas, not necessarily understanding some of the day-to-day -day on the ground issues or how these issues impact families. So talk, let's, Kim, let's start with you. And can you talk to us a little bit about the important perspective that emerging rural leaders bring to either the legislature and in, in, in Beth's case, or uh, in Ashley and Kim, in your cases to county commission, how does this better serve all Oregonians? So with Jefferson County example would be um, some of the reasons why I've chosen to run our impact somewhat to what Ashley said, there's a, a lack of transparency. I'm gonna be transparent. I'm gonna work with the community. And right now we seem to have just this one layer you have your group of people. They're the ones that are asked the questions. They're the ones that come up with the answers. And we have no other um, insight, advice, comments. And so that means we're stagnant. We're, we're, we're continuing to not have answers. And so that's one of the things that's inspired me. So I want to work tri-county. Been already working with a couple people, like an example, you had Phil Chang on recently. Um, it's like, okay, let's get elected and let's work together how our counties can serve each other instead of competing with each other. So that's an example of something, but it's that next level. It's like when you're interested in running and excited about running, you start to see what is missing. And if you're already there, I don't think you necessarily always notice the holes. And so what I want to do is fill some of those holes, bring different people to the table. An example would be, we have very few, if almost none, um, Latinos in our community that are serving um, as elected officials and similar, similar, many of them are actually afraid to run. They might have a family member who's undocumented or similar. So how do I get in office and then be able to be a beacon for those people and say, come to me, let's have conversations about getting you elected. Come to me, let's talk about how do we get service to your community. Come to me and let's have conversations about, all right, you don't wanna run, what do you need? And so we're not even asking those questions right now. That's an example to me of what I see. And then how do we grow this? How do we grow with Grant County? How do we grow with Marion County? Because especially as women leaders, I think that's that network that is growing right now. And it's fantastic. And Jamie, you lead that. And I appreciate that because it inspires us to be better at what we're doing and not just stand alone because we're not going to make it. We have, we have had a few um, Democrats um, on. We, we lost one last uh, two years ago, but he, he joked about being a Democrat versus serving as a Democrat. I don't know if that made sense. He apologized for being a Democrat. It's a nonpartisan, so I just talk about service. It's a little bit different, but to me, it's important to gather and to show what we want to do and move forward. Well, thanks, Kim. And you also talk a lot about serving the ag community, which Absolutely. a lot of people think that's that's a partisan issue. It's not. It's serving yeah. our local economy, serving our, our local uh, community members. And I know that that water issues and, and ag yeah. issues are something that are really important here in Jefferson County. And, and you talk a lot about and champion a lot. The other thing is the diversity of our counties. Um, there's often a lot of misnomers about not understanding how diverse our rural communities are. Jefferson County, for example, you, met, you mentioned the, the, the Latinx Hispanic community, also tribal communities. Um, it, it, here within what's considered Jefferson County is also includes um, the sovereign nation, essentially the Warm Springs uh, Reservation. So that overlap and those relationships are so key. Um, let me, Ashley, let me go next to you. What important perspective do you believe that emerging rural leaders bring to county commissions and how does this better serve all Oregonians? Well, I mean, my leadership philosophy is that you have to be doing the grassroots um, boots on the ground sort of outreach to everyone 
um, across your county or your house district or you know whatever you're wanting to represent as an elected official or as a leader, you have to be communicating with people. Um, and it and what I've seen in our county is I feel like it's kind of a privileged few who get communications with our current county commissioners. Um, ag is huge in our county, but I don't see a lot of discussion about farm workers and people doing the labor every day, day in, day out through wildfires, through pandemics. Um, you know, I, you know, I want to be the person that goes to listen to the farm worker and make sure to physically bring them N95 masks in a crisis. Um, I think that's critical to the health overall of a county um, and trust in government in general. I think we can't um, continue to function how we've been functioning as a society. We need to be more inclusive. Um, also, I think, you know, I just, I have that servant heart of someone that wants to go out to the far reaching areas and talk to the farmer that hasn't been supported and is angry. And yeah, they probably won't vote for me, um, but I will hear them out and I will advocate like no other for that person. And I've done that for the most vulnerable people in our state when I ran the Medicaid long-term care program. You know, these are folks that have no resources and are 100% reliant on the state to get critical services like bathing, eating, dressing. And, you know, I cared about every single one of those cases, making sure that we were getting them what they need. If they had a complaint, we were trying to fix the policy. And it didn't matter what party they were from because I'm dedicated to making sure people's basic needs are met. And I think this comes from, I mean, you know, I remember my grandma who grew up on a dairy farm talking about the utter poverty that she lived in. Her dad was, not only did they have a dairy farm, but he was also a forester, a logger. He was killed on a logging road in a car accident. And that winter, my grandma and her family almost starved. They had to eat what they had in the ground at that time, digging potatoes out and hoping their milk was good by the time they got it to the larger dairy. And I just think, you know, those human, you can't, you, you, you remember that stuff as a child, knowing that they didn't have an advocate in their county to help them. And they didn't have social services to rely on at that time. Um, and I, I think we have to protect and care for all the people in our county. Thank you so much. Also, the, the power of the lived experience or the, the, the stories of our families that help to shape us and shape our, our focus and our ethic and our commitment to serving our communities. The other thing that's so been such a powerful experience for me and talking to so many emerging rural leaders and rural Democrats across our state who are running at all different levels of government is, is redefining the sense of what it is or what it can be to, to be seen as a Democrat, especially in rural areas. We've gotten caught up in this political divide, but the fact of the matter is you have so many folks who bring that servant's heart that you mentioned, Ashley, and who bring that focus on how do we, how do we serve the, the, those who are most struggling uh, amongst us and amongst our communities and tying that, that philosophy in with an understanding and knowledge and the relationships within rural areas. This development of a rural Democrat brand and this building of it, I think is so critically important. And it doesn't take away from, from anyone who's trying to serve our communities, but it gets us out of this kind of either or, or the simple, simplistic model of the, um, that, that people fall into in terms of politics. So I really appreciate all the things that you all are talking about. And you know, from I, I've seen this, the work you all have done and, and it's really it's really powerful. And then also Ashley specifically, that ability to, to tie in and understand the policy implications of what you're seeing and where resources are going is so critically important in government. A lot of folks don't have that perspective and it allows you to be that much more effective and strategic in the investment of our public funds, not just spending public funds, but strategically investing them for the, for the best of our communities and building stronger and healthier communities and more resilient communities and fairer communities. It's such a powerful thing. Thank you. Um, Beth, let me get to you and answer the same question. What's, what important perspective do you think that uh, emerging rural leaders bring and how does it better serve all Oregonians? Well, all the points that have touched, the, the, these two ladies have already touched upon are, uh, are vital, but I wanted to talk about um, as a rural leader, 
we need to be able to offer a different lens for the people in the larger, more populated communities to view our rural communities. Too often we're, re we're perceived as um, obstructionists and sometimes rightfully so when the only voice they hear is from the far right. We need to be able to articulate the needs and the wants of the communities that we are representing. And, and in order to do that, we need to exhibit the ability to sit down at the table and talk with people who have divergent views from ours, divergent needs. We cannot represent and, and reflect on what our people need if we don't stay in the room and have the conversation. And so as rural leaders, I think that's really important that we work on changing that perspective of people who live in Eastern Oregon or people who live in rural areas. We are not all like the one or two people that you see in the public eye. And so we need to be very vigilant about pro projecting a better image, projecting an image of people who want to talk and communicate and move forward to a middle ground so that all the people in our district or our county are better represented and the needs are better met. But we have to look at how are we perceived and how can we change that perception so that people can see the real rural Oregonian or in my case, a rural Eastern Oregonian. I think that's just vital to uh, taking a turn in the economy and uh, as for us in these rural areas. We've gotta be visible and we've gotta project a true image. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. It's kind of that burden of assumption about us. But the other thing, and specifically for you, Beth, because you're, you're running for the legislature, is sometimes the pushback I've heard is that, well, Democrats have a, a majority and, and so there's that tension there. But the beauty of a rural Democrat is being able to work with the uh, work with that majority and bring that the perspective and essentially the political muscle of that majority to address rural issues. And, and that's something that I think so many, those who, who challenge rural Democrats, uh, that's the piece that's missing. So that one, that ability to work together that you talked about, but also that ability to communicate and, and move the, the um, you know, urban Democrats to better understand rural issues and better adapt policies to serve rural communities as well. It's a it's a really powerful point that's missed, I think, when people just politicize this this urban rural divide. Um, let me ask a more personal question. Yeah. Ashley, let me start with you. What historical figure or leader inspires you and why? Oh, so um Probably a lot of people have been saying this lately if you're asking that question, but um, definitely Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, I've always been just enamored with the Supreme Court um, starting when I was a kid again around that same time I was delivering Meals on Wheels um, is when I decided I wanted to be a lawyer and that was after reading um, Sandra Day O'Connor's biography. Um, and so, you know, just seeing then what Ruth Bader Ginsburg did for you know, all people, just equal rights and um, her philosophy, her judicial philosophy was so impressive and impacted so many people that, you know, were otherwise excluded from our systems of government. Um, so I would have to say her. Nice, nice. Um, uh, let me see, Beth, let's go to you next. What historical figure or leader inspires you and why? I found that to be like an overwhelming question. And I happened to have some campaign workers sitting here with me when you asked that question yesterday. And so I said, oh my gosh. And they helped me come to an answer. It, the obvious answer is Desmond Tutu. I love and admire Desmond Tutu for two reasons. One, um, he was a close personal friend of my personal local hero, uh, Rusty Kimsey. Yeah. And so both of those men I hold in high esteem. And the reason I do is because they were able to stay true to their faith and yet 
walk out in service to their community. And um, I just, when I was very small, I had the opportunity to see a portion of the play Cry of the Beloved Country, and I'm probably the only one old enough to remember very much about it. But it was that was the first time that I had any understanding that people were uh, judged by their color or their uh, economic status. You know, growing up in Eastern Oregon, I, I don't even know that I saw a back black person until I was in high school. I mean, really, we were very, we just didn't have a clue. And so um, I had that in my background, that knowledge of that, that awareness. And so because he is a member of my church and, um, and has been able to so gracefully effect change in his community over the years by his steadfastness in standing up for the right thing to do. Uh, that's what makes him my personal hero. It's, um, he was such an amazing man. Um, it reminds me also of, of one of my great childhood heroes is Nelson Mandela, who the ultimate bridging of the divide. Um, that yeah. I had, um, I actually personally started out in a small town, uh, very limited diversity, uh, like you yourself mentioned, Beth, in terms of your early experience. And um, then when I was nine years old, my mom took a teaching job in, in Tanzania and East Africa. And so I went from being the super majority uh, culturally to being the, the um, intense minority. But I had a wonderfully positive experience, but it, it also speaks to that sense of privilege of being able to see and, and that experience of the challenge, whether it's a different language or a different culture or a different community kind of growing up in that setting. Um, and yeah, and, and Desmond Tutu was someone who, um, yet being very faith driven, as you said, and, and, you know, talking about our faith is okay, being driven, but to serve our community based on our faith is, is a very powerful thing. Uh, but also that, that aspect of um, having uh, leaders in our community who, who um, teach us and, and that we can learn from um, that also, you know, those that we look up to um, help to shape our identity. And that, I mean, uh, another thing that comes to mind for me, you're, you're talking about Desmond Tutu is we, in schools, we talk about the importance of, of children having diverse uh, diversity amongst the teaching staff so that kids, especially mm -hmm. kids of color, BIPOC kids can, can see someone that, that they can identify with and develop that sense of this is what a leader looks like. It's so critically important. So it starts with seeing and understanding and respecting, and then it goes to building, to building up and empowering communities. And, and that's something that Desmond Tutu he did his entire life. It's, it's very powerful. Um, Kim, how about you? What, who's a historical figure or leader that inspires you and why? So I'm, my thinking is just different that way. I remember I was gonna be president and I remembered in my early twenties, that's not gonna work out that way. Um, <clears throat> but that was just starting to think politically at all. And that's about when it was 1992, 93, when Oregon had the terrible ballot measure that would allow discrimination against gays and lesbians for housing or where they could meet and similar. And all of a sudden being raised about how everything is fair. And I grew up in Madras. I went to school actually in elementary school, Metolius, which was about half um, uh, the Latino. Back then they were almost all from Mexico. And so I grew up not knowing other people didn't grow up that way. Um, a lot of friends, of course, from the Warm Springs Indian Reservation didn't know people didn't grow up that way. So I had all the sense of fairness and fair play. And all of a sudden I found out, what do you mean you're gonna do a rule that's not fair? How, do, how does that work? How real people would vote for that? And so I remember going to Portland to learn about that because they wanted me, they couldn't believe someone from Jefferson County was interested in this, in fighting this. And so they put me in charge of Jefferson County. I, you know, I'm like 20, Five. I have no clue what I'm doing, but I knew that their message of what they wanted to do to fight it was right, but they were so wrong because they were fighting it as you would fight in Portland and not how we would fight in rural Oregon. And so that was the first time I understood your message isn't going to work. And they were very angry with me that I was going to do a different messaging. And I'm like, if you talk about the fact that some people wouldn't be able to use our library, that's actually a good message for us. That will actually work. If you go on about gay and lesbians, again, this is 1992, 93. I was like, that will not work. And so they're like, well, whatever. Cause they're like one person just get her out the door. And we barely passed it. We were almost a no, which was a big deal for me. I was really proud of that. And that was the first time I understood what a ballot measure was. And so 
at that point, I started having heroes that moved. Um, and so one of the big ones was literally Jim Carrey um, getting involved in a federal campaign. That's where I actually met Jamie. And that was a big deal. What does it mean to go door to door to door for days on end? You know, and then again, Jamie, watching you fight for everybody. So I can't leave out Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg. But again, it's like for me, it's really been this switching thing as I watch people in a sense emerge and be our today leaders. That's been a real powerful thing that has shaped me. And those are the people that I want to emulate. I really appreciate it. And I, I, I'm right there with you with Jim Curry, a great, great individual, um, someone I admire personally, and I'm, I'm proud to, to call a friend. Um, let's let's go into some individual questions now. Beth, I want to start with you. Um, I know that um, one of your priorities, and, and frankly, something that's critical to all rural communities, is building resiliency. So what do rural communities need to address so that uh, young folks are able to remain there and thrive? Well, I keep thinking I need to unmute myself, but I've <laughs> different kind of meeting. The thing that we need for our young people to thrive in our communities, probably the, the first critical thing is um, we need to have good internet and cell phone coverage because that is the cornerstone for so many industries, so many education programs, so many ways of staying connected with the rest of the world that if we don't have that, we're at a disadvantage. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Then we need good jobs and the good jobs of the 50s and 60s are not coming back. And so we need to look for ways that we can uh, bring jobs that are family wage jobs back into these communities, but we're gonna to have to be creative and we're gonna to have to be willing to accept new ways of doing things. We're gonna to have to look at green technology. We're gonna to have to look at uh, farm crops that are uh, not, don't use as much water. There's all kinds of um, things that we're going to have to look at differently. We can't just say, okay, we need more logging jobs. We need more ranching jobs. We need no, more farming jobs. We need to figure out how to make the jobs of the future work for us in Eastern Oregon. We need affordable housing. Mm -hmm. We need help with daycare. Yeah. People can't always afford to work because once they go to work, then they have to pay this big daycare bill and they come out, they don't have as much money in their pocket as if they would stay home on assistance. We need to get our system so that it supports the worker as well as it's, or better than it supports the person who's not working. We need good health care. We need access to health care. All of those things are, um, dependent upon um, access. And so that's where the internet and um, is so important. Uh, we have dramatic demonstrations of how poor internet is hurting our children with the COVID. Children in rural areas, like uh, they're not in my district that I know about, but I know about the kids in Mitchell they were getting the bus driver coming by once a week with a packet of papers and their lunches for the week packed in a cooler. That kid gets no instruction, gets no feedback. If his parents don't know how to help him do his lessons, he has no access to anything to make him do a better, to help him do a better job. So that child is gonna be behind my grandkids who live in Newburgh and you know, the school gives them a tablet and they have access 24 hours a day. And you know, it, it's, the divide is been horribly magnified with COVID. But even in regular times, our kids need that uh, broadband stuff so that they can take advanced classes so they can be able to do the same kids that the kids in Beaverton do. So those yeah. are all really important things. Yeah. Very true. Great. Thank you. Um, Kim, uh, switching to you, you talked about uh, running in the, some of the challenges in Jefferson County. What does it take to get, uh, and it, it's a nonpartisan race, but what do you think it takes to get a Democrat elected in, in rural Jefferson County? And what obstacles are you facing? 
Um, one of them is, 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 you know, you, you, you hear it all the time and you think it doesn't exist. So, but it's the good old boys club. Um, I'm not running against one county commissioner. I'm running against three. You know, you have one county commissioner who's actually running the campaign of the, of my opponent, things like that. And it's just like, really, am I that intimidating? And, and maybe I am. And I hope I am because I do want a lot of change, but they're the common sense change that everybody is saying that they want, like it be broadband, like it be fighting for water, you know, fighting for our fairgrounds as an example, they're pretty basic things. Um, but as far as an obstacle, that is one of the biggest questions I get is what's your political party? What's your political party? And I'm like, I just say, it's a nonpartisan race. I leave that at the table. I need to walk through the door and be there for everybody. And then I have to show them what that looks like. So for me, it's about issues. It's about e being educated about issues and fighting for those issues, whatever they might be. And again, we have such a diverse county. You have to talk about Crooked River Ranch has very different concerns than the Warm Springs Indian Reservation or population does versus Ashwood. What is it? 40 people. You know, you have very, very different concerns. So it's issue focused. It's reaching out to the people and actually getting away from the good old boys club, if you would, and instead talking to the people who are like, wow, she actually wants to hear what I say. And then be able to repeat back and say, yeah, this is what I heard. What do you want to do with this? Where do you want to go? So more and more people contact me and have questions and concerns. That's what I'm looking for. Nice. Um, Ashley, a, a very important aspect of your role as county commissioner is making land use decisions. Um, talk to us about your philosophy with regard to land use decisions and, you know, do you, I know one of the issues in Marion County is the expansion of urban growth boundaries uh, of the cities. Is that something you favor or talk to us a little bit about your philosophy around uh, land use? Yeah, um, I think, you know, I'm the kind of person that will want to consider each situation as it comes forward. I'm not going to, you know, make this, you know, predetermined outcomes for things. So I would want to talk to everyone involved as the decisions come forward, hear everyone out. Um, in general, I think that, you know, because we have such amazing and productive agricultural land in our county, I really want to preserve and protect that. I really want to protect our family farms. I feel like once you expand out into productive agricultural land, there's no going back. Um, and there's other, you know, impacts from that. And um, I think some of the development that's happened, we didn't do the appropriate amount of investigation or research into whether there is enough water or are you impacting um, other agricultural operations or family farms downstream because you put a housing development on um, farmland upstream. And so I think, you know, I, my philosophy would be to protect um, our farmland. And, you know, I think everyone here is proud of the products we produce. They're world renowned. Um, and I think the other thing that we should be doing in our more urban areas is looking at housing density prior to expanding the urban growth boundary. I think in particular in Salem and Kaiser, there's a lot of empty space. There's a lot of, um, you know, empty lots, empty buildings. And so there's been a lot of really innovative de development lately. Um, I think we could incentivize on the county commission um, development of some of these lots in the more urban areas and save that farmland for farming. Well, and that, uh, thanks for that. It also, when you have more intensified development, it, it addresses issues like transportation and allows for some of those solutions. And it, and frankly, also, like you're saying, protects rural areas as well. So this, this collaboration between the two in partnership, but at the same time, preserving those unique aspects is, is really valuable. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Beth, let me go back to you. Um, we've talked a lot, a lot about the, um, access to internet and cell service, especially in rural communities. And what are your thoughts on, um, or what are some of your plans or ideas for making sure that everyone can be connected and has access regardless of their, their circumstance? Well, um, one of the things is we've got to be open to creative plans that are going to develop the infrastructure so that we have better internet. Um, 
we seem to have a history of if I have good access to internet, then that's good enough. Yeah. And, and we're not looking at does the little boy who lives at the end of Moon Creek Road and up the hill have good enough access. We, we need to be, we need to look for the needs of the least of us, not that those of us of privilege, you know, I have plenty good service. I don't need better service, but I'm not the person who's trying to get educated, work, uh, maybe have a at home business that they need uh, good uh, connectivity. And so it's not enough to, look and say, well, you know, 75% of the people or 60% of the people are well covered. No, we need to look at how do we address the needs of those um, 25 to 40% of the people whose needs are not being met. And that means that we're going to have to think outside the box. We're going to have to be willing to accept public grants or go after public grants. And we're going to have to be willing to support the people who want to put the time and energy into finding those monies that develop. Um, we have been working on improving the fiber optics between here and Burns and there are people that don't want to do it. Wow. And because they don't need it, they don't think anybody else needs it. And so we need to do a better job of educating, going after funding and thinking of the least of these. Thanks. I think that's a start on that. And um, so it means that when we vote on a, a tax bill that's going to charge cell phones $4.75 a year, we think of that as this is a good opportunity to do a lot of good work for my people and my community and nobody is paying very much for that help. Mm -hmm. We don't need to think of that as, oh, I said no new taxes or whatever. We need to think about the opportunities that we can provide with the, a little bit of change in the way we spend our money or live our lives. Thank you. Um, Kim, what we've, you've talked a bit about the challenges uh, are facing folks in Jefferson County. Um, what are your top priorities as county commissioners, what, as county commissioner, what would they be and how does that differ from what's happening now? talked about broadband. Um, we'll use an example of what's not happening and, and or what's so detrimental. I was at a county um, commissioner joint and city of Madras meeting, which city council meeting once a month, they do that this month, it was at the city council. Um, and so literally, you have one of the staff of city of Madras say, hey, we've got some options, we might be able to work for broadband, there's some funding out there. Um, I need to do this with the county because that's what county commissioners do. They have to hold that, do collaboration with city government so we can move forward to request grants and similar. Right now, Wyden and Merkley are, are doing a fantastic job of trying to get us money for broadband and similar. And everyone literally sat there. I was like, oh. so the difference would be, I would be saying, what do you need from the commissioner to make that happen and can I help you with that? It, it's that simple, that collaboration, that stepping forward and say, I wanna help you. You don't have to like everybody, just do your job. You know? And so it's not happening in the city of Culver. It's not happening with Crooked River Ranch. It's happening better now because they're running their candidates. I want it to happen all the time. I want good collaboration. So we've got the broadband. I think that would make a good economic a change for our community, housing, affordable housing. The city of Madras has done a lot of work around housing. County has not supported that at all. This county should be leading. They should be supporting the cities and similar. So, and um, we do a pretty good job on roads um, and similar, but it's like, we, we do very little with the schools. I would love to see, it's like you talked about actually filling the spaces in Kaiser and Salem. I would love to have programs that worked with our trade program that's just starting to develop at our high school again. When I went to high school, they built a, a house every other year. What I would like to see is we have derelict buildings within our city of Madras. Get the high school teams in there. Contractors are willing to help if they know, okay, I'm a plumber. I only have to help two weekends the month of October. I'm in, you know, because people have said, I can't find workers. Well, if you could work with high school students for a couple weekends and find out who's the plumber, who could be electrician that I can train up, all of a sudden, you might actually have somebody go on forward. They're going to come back to the community, have a good job. We're going to have a house that's now a house that's rentable. It doesn't look terrible. 
I actually talked with two banks. Both banks said they would be happy to work with the high schools because they cannot sell those buildings. Those buildings, once they are, once they are made well, they would be more than willing to help share the profits in that so the money would go back to the high school. So what is the commission sitting there? You have to put the egg money, the, the nest egg money out so that now the schools can start because they don't have the funds for that. It, it, it's not rocket science, it's just teamwork. And all it needs is someone who's excited to be on a team. That's great, thank you. Um, Ashley, it, we've been, there's been a lot of conversation about economic development and, and, and helping to, to strengthen uh, communities in terms of their economy. Um, you mentioned before the Santiam Canyon is, is in uh, Marion County, and that area was already her, uh, economically depressed before the wildfires, and now we've had the devastating wildfires. Um, so, so people are hurting even more. What, what are your ideas and what would you do to help those communities recover? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I love what you're saying, Kim. Awesome. <laughs> about what you I get excited do. about that one, I have to admit. Yeah. I just... It Amazing. just is such a win for everybody, right? Yeah, we can see the excitement in your voice. It's like <laughs> you're on fire. Um, so I think, you know, our communities up the San Diego Canyon have just, I mean, it's so tragic, you know, how many people have lost their primary home, um, so many structures damaged. Um, we are going to not be able to shoulder all of the cost of rebuilding everything. And I think everyone is committed to rebuilding um, because we all love those communities. Um, and it's going to take those relationships and the teamwork that Kim is talking about. And I, I feel like I have an advantage there because I do have really strong relationships with people in our federal delegation. I do have strong relationships in the Oregon legislature and with the state agencies. And I know how to do that type of work, how to put together proposals and plans and to lobby and advocate for our county at the legislature with city governments and with our federal delegation. The other thing that I'm excited to do is I think now is the opportunity to really get some of our infrastructure investment up there. Mm. Like we have got to put sewer in up in Detroit and that's been in the works, um, but we've now just seen, you know, everybody has septic and it's so dangerous now with everything that's happened, people's properties being so badly damaged. We've got to install sewer along with that. We should be looking at putting the power lines underground as we rebuild. We should be looking at ensuring that people can't just rebuild exactly what they have, but that they can get a little bit extra so that they can put the right kind of siding, covered gutters, you know, roofs that are not going to instantly light on fire. Um, and, you know, looking at how we rebuild up there will save money long term um, for the state, the feds, the county and cities, if we're smart about it. So, you know, I'm excited to roll up my sleeves and get to work helping people breaking down any of those, you know, bureaucratic barriers that pop up. There's all these deadlines, you know, people tomorrow is the deadline for signing up for the ash and trash process, which is trying to get all the debris removed from your property. November, there's a FEMA deadline. People don't even have a way to communicate very well yet. So, you know, I want to be the advocate that is like, okay, maybe you missed that deadline, but I'm going to help you get this application submitted. I'm going to help you get through this process. And I'm also going to be the one to help you have semi-permanent housing where there is some while we rebuild and the services and supports that you need to be healthy and independent while we get your community back in shape. Those are all such huge issues. First of all, just the information piece, especially in rural communities where whether it's limited rural broadband or also just making sure people have access to the information so people know what they can and can't do, what resources are available, such an important point. The uh, transitional housing is huge right now. I mean, our, our state's been in a housing crisis for years, so many counties, but especially in, in your area, in, in, um, in the Santiam area, and then also in Southern Oregon, of course, that transitional housing aspect is, um, it's so many people are trying to figure that out now. Your background experience is really uh, is really powerful in that regard in terms of creating solutions. And then also 
that piece of the long-term thinking as we rebuild, um, making sure we're we're addressing the the the, uh, the cost savings you mentioned, not just in the structures, but in public health and so many other areas that when it's well thought through, the impacts are there. So really appreciate that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we're running we're running tight on time, so I wanted to uh, just ask you all. And uh, Beth, let's start with you. How do voters learn more about you and what help do you need right now? Ballots have just gone out. Um, so what, what, if folks want to learn more about your campaign, how do they do that? What's your website? or? Okay, my website is um, the spell for um, Eastern Oregon. Just all spelled out, best spell for Eastern Oregon .com. I do have a Facebook page and it is the same, best spell for Eastern Oregon. And I also have an Instagram account. So uh, you could go to either my Facebook page or my web page and find out my um, kind of contact information. And the best thing you could do would be to share that information in, in whatever way that you can. Um, it's a matter of getting the word out to people that there is, you do have a choice. You so, so often we don't have a choice here in Eastern Oregon. Usually somebody's appointed midterm and then they no one runs against them. And so then they are, you know, in for in for the long haul without ever having to campaign or have any competition. So I think it's if you can help getting the word out, that's important. Uh, we are operating on about 10 percent of the budget that our opponent has. And uh, I think we've done a good job with the money we've had. And uh, we're just hoping to offer people a, a voice and a choice. So if you can spread the word, that would be the best thing you could do at this point. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, on to you. How do voters learn more about you and what do you need right now? So um, the number one place is gonna be my Facebook page, Kim Smith for county commissioner, just go on there. And um, if you're clicking on that, I have an event this uh, Saturday that's going to be um, Spanish and being translated from English into Spanish. So anyone you know that's the, that is um, wanting more information but they're uncomfortable with things in English, kick that information to them, that would be fine. And that's in a person's yard so people can feel safe um, versus maybe a very public event. But what I just really need is for people to share um, and I just need people to vote. At the end of the day, we just need to vote. We need to go out there and vote. Ask three people that you know, did you vote? Did you get it done? And by the way, vote Kim Schmidt. So. <laughs> and that's S-C-H-M-I-T-H. -H. It took yep. me forever to learn how to spell your last name correctly. Typo when my family came through in the mid 1800s. So. <laughs> Actually, us a new name. Let's, let's wrap up with you. How do uh, voters learn more about you and what help do you need right now? Um, my website is Ashley for Oregon with the number four in the middle. I don't know if you can see that if I hold it up, maybe um, that's the best way. I have Facebook, Instagram, same handle, the Ashley for with the number um, Oregon. I need um, help, help with phone banking, um, no contact literature drops. We're wearing masks, gloves, and just dropping without knocking um, and um, donations like everybody else. Um, but this has just been a wild ride. I applaud um, all of you ladies for running. It's an unprecedented time to run <laughs> um, and we're doing it. So exactly what both of Beth and Kim said, we, I got my ballot today. It's going in the drop box this evening. So <laughs> let's get our ballots in and get out the vote in whatever way you can. Definitely telling your friends, family, and hounding them until they drop them off. And the young people. Hounding them until voters. they do, and getting friends to do as well. That's right, so ballots have already gone in the mail. Some people have received them. If you haven't, they you'll re be receiving them shortly. And uh, voting as early as possible is really key. So, but also be an informed voter. So study up on the candidates, on the ballot measures, make sure that you um, know what their background is, make sure that, that they will serve you <laughs> well and with integrity. It's really, it's so important right now. Uh, and I think especially for um, rural Dems or Dems running in, in rural areas, that message of uh, look to the candidate for the value they bring and the integrity they bring and the service that they will provide for our community and really for our state in, in general. Um, every single race is important also. 
there's a lot of attention, rightfully so, on the presidential race, but every single race is important. And the impact on our lives from city council races, local races, is, is sometimes just as important, sometimes even more, more striking than, than at the federal level. So make sure that you vote uh, down, uh, down the entire ballot. Again, learn about the candidates and vote for who will best represent you and your family. Um, get your ballots in early. You can either mail them, we postage is paid this year, or you can drop them in a, in a designated drop box to make sure that your ballot counts. And just lastly, your vote is your voice. And it's so important for all of our voices to be heard. So vote, vote, vote. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm so proud to show off some great rural candidates to uh, those watching. And uh, take care, everyone. And don't forget to vote. Thank you. Thank you.